what you're seeing today is uh, the the Jason of multiple days camping in a row, and so hopefully this will work out okay. Uh, you really can't underestimate how frazzled the experience of camping can make you. I love it. I enjoy it. Uh, great time with my family and the other families here from the journey who are with us uh, out at McKinney Creek on Altoona. And, uh, but it just kind of gets you scattered. Uh, so y'all pray for me this morning. And uh, in fact, let's just go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus because we know that in his name uh, we have access to you. We know that in his name, um, not only do we have um, safety with you, but we have a, the place of being cherished by you. And God, that should just arrest our hearts, just arrest our attention this morning to help us realize that if we are in Christ Jesus, we are in a position of being cherished by you. Lord, I pray that you'd open our hearts and our minds to understand the things spoken of this morning. God, I pray particularly and specifically, Father God, for people who might be here this morning and maybe they have heard the gospel in one form or another preached tens, hundreds, thousands of times. And yet, somehow, some way, Lord God, they have... Um, They've been unaffected by it. I pray this morning, Lord God, that you, your Holy Spirit would come and enliven their hearts. That you would breathe life into their spiritually dry bones. That they would be caused to see and understand things that they could not see or understand without your help. We love you and we praise you. We ask all of these things for Jesus and for his glory. Amen. Turn your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 16. This is our last message in the book of Leviticus before we, moved into, before we move into Hebrews uh, beginning next week. I have said all along that um, Leviticus puts forward a lot of themes. It's not the only book to do so. The, the first five books of the Bible um, are so formative in the way um, we understand them. They really are forming a basis. They're forming a foundation for us. And we could spend, literally, you could spend a long, long time in Genesis 1 through 3. Just all of the foundation that those three chapters build and lay for us. And then we have the rest of the book of Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers. and These are um, foundational books for us, and Leviticus is one of those. And we've looked at a lot of themes since we've got started in the book. And uh, we ultimately don't see the resolution of these themes until Jesus Christ. And he is the one who resolves all of these things. And so we'll get more in-depth in that as we move in a verse-by-verse study through the book of Hebrews. But this morning, I, I want to... To be able to address uh, all of us this morning with what I would say is, is a very simplistic understanding um, of the gospel. What Jesus Christ has done to put us right with God. Because there is a universal problem. Uh, a universal problem that began in the book of Genesis in some of those uh, foundational chapters, we see the first man and the first woman walking in communion daily with God. Uh, and then within a few short chapters, this relationship is shattered. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 24 says, God drove them out of the garden. He drove them out. They, they were in the, in the garden of God's presence, if you will. In the garden of, of peace with God. In the garden of tranquility. In the garden where things are good and they are right. And they are driven out of the good and the right. They are driven out of the peaceful. And the, uh, the place humanity has been finding itself in for thousands of years since that time is the place of not being right with God. The place of 
feeling driven out, feeling separated, feeling like we are far from God. And even if you are a Christian here this morning, you are in Christ. Because we are so prone to listen to the lies of the devil, and we are so prone to listen to his accusations, we will oftentimes feel driven out. We will oftentimes experience this sense of separation from God. That sense for the Christian is a lie. It's an illusion. There is no separation from God in Jesus Christ, no matter how we may feel about it at any time. But sometimes we do feel that we have been driven out, no longer in God's presence. We feel abandoned. We feel roughly treated. Our problem, the universal problem of humanity is that humanity is cut off from relationship with God unless a provision is made. And we have looked every single week throughout Leviticus so far at Leviticus chapter 26, verses 11 and 12. Leviticus 26, verses 11 and 12, because they, they are a, a center point for this book, ultimately a, a foundational verse that helps us understand what's Leviticus all about? Why do we need a book like this? And he says in, God says through Moses in verse 11 of chapter 26, I will make my dwelling among you. This is such a powerful thing because his dwelling hasn't been with them since the Garden of Eden. They've been driven out. I will make my dwelling among you and my soul shall not abhor you, although his soul should abhor them, could justly abhor them, and they could be under God's righteous wrath for all eternity. He says, I'm making a provision and I will walk among you and I will be your God and you shall be my people. And so God is making a provision for relationship um, that sinful people might be able to have with them. And this is not new to you. You've been hearing this ultimately week after week in one form or another. And last week we were introduced to the Day of Atonement and we dealt with some of its particulars in Leviticus chapter 16. We looked at kind of some summary verses at the end of that chapter. Today we're going to read verses 7 through 22. So Leviticus 7, uh, I'm sorry, Leviticus 16 verses 7 through 22. Now as we're reading from this text this morning, please keep in mind that what is happening here is the provision in shadow. The provision in shadow. You see, a shadow is caused as the sun passes across an object and you see the shadow, but its real form is the thing that the sun washes across. Okay? And so what we see this morning in the Day of Atonement, this ceremony that was meant to arrest the attention of individuals, what we see is this, um, uh, this shadow of atonement. So... Chapter 16, beginning in verse 7. Let's read there. Leviticus 16, beginning in verse 7. It says, Then he shall take the two goats. Now, we mentioned these goats last week, and I said we'd deal with them this week. We dealt with some of the particulars of the text and brought out some principles that were uh, helpful for us last week, and today we really get into the ceremony proper. Then he shall take these two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lo lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. We'll get into that a little later. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. Now just a note on this word, this strange word, Azazel. It's not, um, it's not interpreted for us, or it's not translated for us, because quite honestly, the interpreters have a really hard time with it. Uh, they think it could mean one of a, a few different things. Things, and it's very cryptic in the original language. But the, the, the idea comes across from any of the different ways it's translated. The idea that comes across for this word Azazel is the idea of forgetting. The idea of forgetting. So this goat for um, Azazel 
he is going to be um, going to go through the ceremony. He's going to have the sins of the whole people of Israel confessed over his head. He's going to be taken out in the wilderness to Azazel. The, he's taken to the place of forgetting. Okay, and so as we talk about this ceremony this morning, what we're what we're trying to understand is this idea that God is through this provision forgiving. And forgetting. He's forgiving and forgetting. Verse 11, we continue. Aaron shall present the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall kill the bull as a sin offering for himself. And he shall take a censer full of coals of fire from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of sweet incense, beaten small, and he shall bring it inside the veil. Inside the veil. Um, There is, in the tabernacle, or even later in the temple, there are divisions of the temple, divisions of the tabernacle. You, it seems like you, you're going kind of further and deeper in as you go. There's the outer court, and then there's the, uh, the inner court, and then there's the most holy place. The most holy place has a massive no entrance sign on it in the form of a veil that is 70 feet high. This was in the later temple. During the tabernacle, it would have been lower. But later, when the temple was brought in, all of God's prescriptions were that this veil on, um, over this room, which would house God's presence in a very special way, This veil was 70 feet high. Now that says, stop. You can't come in here. You don't have access to this place. God's presence in a very real and manifest way is residing over what's called the mercy seat. This is the place where atonement is made for the sins of the people of Israel. Atonement is the idea that they could be put right with God. No longer separated from God, which is the universal human problem, okay? This feeling of being driven out, being being abandoned. And so, over this place, there is this huge veil. It was made of very, very finely twined linen. It was usually a royal blue, purple kind of color. And it was something that not even the strongest man could take it and tear it. It was that thick it was that substantial okay and that is the veil that is here this is God's declaration to the people that I am not like you I am other than you I am holy and for you to be in my presence you would be incinerated so Aaron when he enters this place he's the high priest and only one day of the year this one man from one family of of levi of the nation of israel only one day of the year could he enter this place and when he entered he brings some incense the bible says that it's it's beaten small he brings it inside the veil and he'll put the incense on the fire before the lord that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is over the testimony, so that he does not die. So, Aaron brings the incense into the most holy place. He goes behind the veil. He goes behind the massive no entry sign. He goes behind the veil this one day of the year with this incense, puts it on the the fire, and what it creates is immediately smoke. One day of the year could this one man enter this place and he had to do it in such a way that a buffer was created. Smoke was created. Because God's presence is so holy. God's presence is so other. What did he do it for? So that he he wouldn't die. The text is clear. So that he wouldn't die. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side. And in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering. Okay, this is the the two goats, remember? One for the sin offering, one for Azazel, one for forgetting. 
Uh, I lost it. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, that is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil, and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. Then he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel. So he enters, Aaron enters with the incense, creates the smoke, so that this buffer is created. Why is is he initially entering? So that he can clean the place. Just this place being in the presence of the people of Israel who are intensely sinful has defiled the place. We talked about this a lot last week. Okay? And so he's got to enter in, and he has to clean the place because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel and because of their transgressions, all their sins. And so he shall do for the tent of meeting which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one may be in the tent of meeting from the time he enters to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out and has made atonement for himself and for his house and for all the assembly of Israel. Then he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it and shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around and he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the people of Israel. And when he has made an end of atonement for the holy place and the tent of meeting on the altar, he shall present the live goat. So at this point in time, the one goat that the lot was cast, and this was the, lo- the, the, the goat for the Lord, sin is confessed on the head of this goat, and then he's slain, his b- blood is applied in the particular fashion to the mercy seat. This symbolizes that the whole people of Israel's collective sins, as the people in covenant with God, are forgiven. Okay? They are forgiven. But now there is... A second goat. And when he's made an atonement for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall present the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area. And he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. So imagine somebody, your sin is confessed on the head of this animal and then it's let out. And you can see it as the congregation, as the whole people of God. You're watching this goat representing the, the collection of all your sins. The collection of all your rebellion, all of your wickedness, all of, your, all of the times that you said, I got to know you said this, but we're going to do it this way. I know that you're clear on this, but I feel like this is going to work out better for me and my family. All the times you've walked your own way, all the times you've lived a self-styled life, and you see that goat, he's being led out through the wilderness, and and he he gets far enough to where you can't hardly see him anymore, and then they take him any even further than that so that your sins are taken to this place of forgetting. So God's not only demonstrating that he's forgiving, he's demonstrating that he's forgetting. And we think, right, we always think the idea that, well, God knows everything. God's keeping account. He's got a list and he's checking it twice. He's like Santa Claus, and at the end, he's going to take the list out and he's going to see uh, how we did. Well, according to Leviticus 16 and countless other texts in the Bible, God is a forgetful God. He is a God who chooses of himself willingly to send the account of our sins away. You see, our sins don't only need to be atoned for, they also need to be forgotten. They need to be sent away. And so later we would hear John the Baptist say in John chapter 1, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world another word for azazel that you'll often hear uh, preachers use it is the the idea of scapegoat okay it can be translated as scapegoat so in other words someone else is going to bear this penalty someone else is going to go into this place of abandonment go into this place of forgetting so that we don't have to 
Jesus was our scapegoat who would take our sin, not only atone for it, not only receive the penalty it deserved, but also take it away. Isn't that what we need? Don't we need for our sin to be completely and fully and finally forgotten? And isn't that the thing that we really, really struggle to believe? We, we, we believe, I think, functionally at least, that God has to know. He, he's got to keep an account. He's got to keep tabs on us. He has to hold these things near so that, you know, when we, we sin once and then we repent and then we sin, we sin that same sin again and then we, go to, we say to ourselves, well, I can't, I can't go back to him and repent again because I just did that last week and I repented and, and he's going to think, I don't want to hear that from you anymore. But sins are being taken away to this place of forgetting. How merciful a God and how, let's be honest, I mean, the way we work in our relationships with people, we say, fool me once and shame on me. Fool me twice, shame on you because I'm not going to forget. I'm not going to forget. I'm going to keep a list. I'm going to keep a record of wrongs. The, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, this great chapter we, we call the love chapter, right? It says that love keeps no account of wrongs suffered. God has experienced wrongs suffered against him since Adam and Eve in the garden. Every wrong that has ever been committed has been committed against God. And the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 3 that God is love and love keeps no account of wrongs suffered. So God, for those who are forgiven through atonement, keeps no account of wrongs suffered. You blew it last week, and you blew it the same way again this week, and yet, if we believe what the Bible says, God's not going, oh, hey, whoa, you did that last week. What are you back here dragging your tail into my courts again, repenting of the same sin? No. No, God has forgotten. We'll see more from that in another text later. This text, Leviticus 16, is concerned with the whole point of the Bible. Some people struggle to figure out what this book is really about. What's it really about? It's really about how you, as a sinful person, can be loved and accepted by a God who's never sinned. That's the whole point of the book. How you can experience relationship with God. And maybe you've heard this story, maybe you've heard the gospel in some form, hundreds of ways, and yet, for some reason, the the light hasn't come on, and you haven't realized that you can come into relationship with God. And I hope that this morning is a change. I hope it's a change. This text is concerned with the whole point of the Bible. And it's so critical that you understand some of the things that are coming out in this text. This whole people of God, they are God's covenant people, and yet only one of them on one day of the year from one family, from one nation, could come into this place, and he had to come in with smoke. But now everybody can come in. Any person who comes through faith can come in. And you don't need smoke. You don't need anything to protect you from God's presence. I want to, I want to explain to you how that happened. It's pretty phenomenal, actually. Um, before I get there, I I just, I jumped ahead of myself real quick. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. 
I, I really hate dipping into Hebrews because we're fixing to like go there and be there for a long time. But Hebrews and Leviticus are absolutely yoked together. Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, we could say sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. I always find it interesting. I don't know why they do this. I need to find out why they say places because um, the word place is actually supplied. It's not even in the Greek. Um, what's there is since we have, um, we have the confidence to enter the holy. And, and place is supplied, is, is understood. But the word holy is uh, hagios, and it's in, the, uh, it's in the singular, not the plural. So I don't know why they come up with places. But anyway... Um, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. So this one man on one day of the year from one family, from one nation, came in probably scared to death, let's be honest. Scared to death with smoke, this buffer, and yet now we can enter this holy place confidently without being afraid. But we are still afraid a lot of times, aren't we? When we approach God, when we pray, when we repent, when we take communion, when we, when we do holy things, there is a fear that grips us sometimes because we have not yet fully embraced the confidence that we have in Jesus Christ. The, the problem of the Garden of Eden is being made right here in shadow in Leviticus and Hebrews tells us about it in full. So I want to explain how this confidence came about. Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. Turn your Bibles there. So let, let, me, let me give some summary. Um, people... And all of them, all of you, me, everybody that we know, the best people you've ever known in your life, the most moral, most ethical, the highest of integrity, every person you've ever known has this problem of being separated from God because of sin. Romans chapter 3 tells us, for all have sinned and fallen short of what? The glory of God. We've fallen short of God's glory, which means we've fallen short of relationship. There can't be any relationship here if things continue as they are. So we've been separated from God, and now we are given the ability, according to Hebrews chapter 10, to confidently walk into God's presence and say, Hey, Daddy. Hey, Father. We are given the confidence to do that when Aaron entered with smoke to protect him from God's presence. How did, so how did we go from separated from God to I can walk in confidently now and know that God is my father and he loves me and he wants to hear me talk to him. He wants relationship with me. Mark chapter 15 Beginning in verse 36, and uh, I, I'm a, thankful for a man named Justin Motes for giving me this little uh, help here in, in the way of viewing this text. So I want you to imagine as we read this text, we'll start in, uh, in verse 36 of chapter 15. I want you to imagine that you're a film director, okay? I want you to imagine that you're a film director and you've got a camera. And think about in each verse we read, where is the camera? 15 beginning in verse 36. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. Where's the, where's the camera? It, it's, it's on Jesus, right? The, the camera is on the cross. The camera's on the cross. If you're a film director, that's exactly what you're watching at this point in time. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. 
Now, where is the camera now? In the temple, over a half a mile away, in this high holy place, where Jesus is out on the hill where sinners die. He's been led outside the camp. Remember the scapegoat? He's led outside the camp. He's led out into the wilderness. Jesus is outside the camp. He's just breathed his last. We see the camera move from right there without any explanation whatsoever. Now the camera is in the temple half a mile away. Looking at this veil, which we've already said had this, was this huge no entry sign. You can't come in here. There's no access. Only one man, one day of the year, from one family and one nation could enter. And then, with smoke. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. If you were going to try to tear a 70 foot high veil in two, you would start at the bottom. But it starts from the top. What does that signify? That someone at the top tore it. Okay, so the camera was on Jesus. Then the camera is on the temple. Now look at verse 39. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. Where's the camera now? It's back at the cross again, isn't it? It's on Jesus again. So, sandwiched in between Jesus uttering his last breath on the cross and the centurion's recognition that this man is the Son of God, that is a recognition that only the Holy Spirit of God brings about in a person. Sandwiched in between that is this interesting detail about the temple a half a mile away. What do you think the significance is? What's he getting at here? Well, we could say it lots of different ways, that there's a, there's a connection here. Well, I, I think the best way to, to think about it is that there is a cause and effect relationship here. There is a cause and effect relationship here. The no entry sign got torn down when Jesus breathed his last. What we're seeing is the Day of Atonement. Not the one that happened year after year after year after year with the goats of or the, the blood of goats and bulls uh, cleansing the, the, the altar and the, the whole, the whole uh, sanctuary and, and cleansing all of these things and then going for the sins of the priests and all, this whole elaborate ceremony. This is the day of atonement that all of that shadow pointed to and so jesus breathes his last and the no entry sign is gone and guess who responds a, a gentile who was killing jesus a gentile who was killing jesus this centurion, fully complicit and involved in the death of the Messiah, the death of the Lamb of God, he's the one who would be given saving faith. So whatever it is that you think you have on your account, whatever messed up stuff you've got in your closet, whatever bag of sins you think is too big to forgive and then forget to be taken outside the camp. This man was killing God. And God's mercy extended to him. So I don't know if you realize the, the just the the earth shattering implications only one man one day of the year and now anybody through faith but it's clear the bible is very clear you cannot come any other way you cannot come into this most holy place 
any other way. You cannot come into this place bringing a, a list of all the good things you've done. See, God, I'm a good person, and when you weigh my good against my bad, surely there's a little more good than bad. You see, that's not the way we come. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith. And he continues to make the argument that it's not about works at all. Because then you could boast. Then you could say, you had something to do with your salvation. But God is putting forward a way of salvation where he and he alone would receive the glory. He and he alone would be understood and construed as the hero of the story. The implications here. I mean, the high priest walks in scared to death, and now you, common anybody, can enter this holy place with confidence through faith in Jesus Christ. Wow. Wow. A Gentile killing Jesus could enter. Man, that's staggering. That's staggering. I want to share with you just some implications of this. And most of them, I think, I think all of them come ultimately from Leviticus 16 and then are played out in other texts as well. We talked about this a little bit last week. We talked about how Aaron, whenever he entered the, the most holy place on the Day of Atonement, um, he, would, he would wear something different than he always wore. He, he was always wearing his ceremonial robes when he was doing the normal sacrifices. Um, and and, and it, these ceremonial robes were, man, it was a pretty awesome getup. And, and he had a, a hat, kind of a, a, a miter hat is what they would call it, basically, and a, a, a turban or something like that, if you will. And then he's got this whole blue royal blow, blue getup and, and this breastplate on. I mean, it was awesome. And then but he would set that aside, and he would enter the most holy place in linen garments. Basically, as close to naked as you could get and as close to common a garment as you could get, which was to symbolize his humility and his dependence on God. So let me say this. If you are confidently entering the most holy place, then you are rightly dressed. You are dressed in what your humility, if you will, is dependence on Jesus. And that's why I said you can't come any other way. If you show up in any other clothing to try to enter the most holy place, and by clothing I simply mean what it is that you would have confidence in. If you want to show up to relationship with God, having confidence that you're a good person, having confidence that you've always gone to church, having confidence that you've given more money than anybody else, having confidence that you've done any of these, if you show up with any of that, you don't get to come in. You don't get to come in. We could go into the ideas, uh, the New Testament parables Jesus te tells about the, the guests to the wedding feast who show up. How are they clothed, you know? That kind of thing. So you are rightly dressed only through faith. Our humility is dependence on Jesus. Not only have your sins been forgiven, but they have been forgotten. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and lawless deeds no more. So you enter into and you walk day by day in relationship with God through faith with a God who doesn't remember your sins. They were taken away. They were taken away. So you're rightly dressed through faith. Another implication is that you cease working to become a better person. You cease working to try to merit God's acceptance. You quit trying to put yourself right with God through being good. You quit working interesting thing about the day of atonement um verse 31 of leviticus 16 says the day of atonement is a sabbath of solemn rest to you 
And you shall afflict yourselves, which is the idea of fasting. It's a statute forever. This day was a Sabbath of solemn rest to symbolize that in the work of atonement, you have nothing to do. You have no work to offer. This day, it was a solemn day of rest. He said, you don't do anything because I want you to be aware. I want you to recognize that when I forgive and when I forget, you had nothing to do with it. Which means you can't mess it up. Because, right, if we had anything to do with it, we would mess it up. You cease working. You see, and this is what makes gospel Christianity so radically different from what we understand quite often in the South. A friend of mine in North Carolina has called it quaint religious moralism. And a lot of times it will adopt the Jesus tag, okay? Yeah, I'm a Christian I'm a good person. I do, all, I do these things and I'm moral and I try to make good decisions and I try to look out for other people and I try to help people and all these kinds of things. You see, religion is always about what you need to be doing. You need to try harder. You need to be a better person. You need to give more, be more generous, be more hospitable. We can take all of the commands of the Bible and we can place them in the do list for people who view this book religiously. Religion is all about what you have to do. Gospel Christianity is all about what Jesus has done. Religion says do. Gospel says done. When he breathed his last, the veil was torn from top to bottom while people sat there resting. Not working, not trying, not giving it their best shot. <laughs> you see, this makes sense of Jesus' words, doesn't it? In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come to me, all you who, are, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly of heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says to all of the religious do-gooders out there, all of the moralists, all of the people who would say I'm a Christian, but their confidence is in Jesus plus something else. He would say to all of those people, lay all of your other confidence down. Lay your work down, your accomplishments down, your achievements, your attainments, your credentials. Lay all of your work down. Come to me. I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. The third implication is that you are, you are freed from your former bondage. You're freed from your former bondage. Uh, Charles Spurgeon helped me to see this. It's pretty awesome. Uh, Spurgeon was pretty awesome. Um, Leviticus chapter 29, uh, I'm sorry, verse 25. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 9. It's worthy to turn there and make a mark here. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 9. And this verse comes in a, in a strange chapter describing something that... Um, comes to be known as, as the year of Jubilee. Now, uh, just to let you know, there's a lot of nonsense on the television and the internet about this year of Jubilee. Just to let you know, uh, the health, wealth, prosperity teachers use it to all kinds of, oh, it's horrible. They're going to answer for it. Um, Leviticus chapter 25, verse 9. Then you shall sound the loud trumpet on the tenth day of the seventh month. Know what else happens on the 10th day of the 7th month? We talked about it last week and today. The Day of Atonement was on the 10th the day of the 7th month. And this is on the 50th year. So every 50 years on the 10th day, on the 7th month, uh, he says, on the Day of Atonement you shall sound the trumpet throughout 
all your land. And you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you when each of you shall return to his property and each of you shall return to his clan. Now let me give you the idea here of what's happening. Um, Jubilee happened every 50 years to free people who had come into slavery. It would basically be an idea of uh, the way of thinking about indentured servitude. Maybe you, you owed a debt of some amount, you couldn't pay it off, and so you went to work for somebody and basically you... You became their slave to pay off a debt that you owed. And every 50th year, all debts got canceled. And so you could be a slave for a number of years to try to pay off a debt, but every 50th year, on the Day of Atonement, when atonement is made, sins are forgiven and forgotten, immediately, he says, the trumpet gets blown. The reason I feel comfortable... Um, making this application is because the New Testament makes the application all the way through and as well do the, the Old Testament prophets that exiles go free when their sins are atoned for. Romans chapter 6 tells us that we are freed from sin's penalty and from sin's power. So all of the things that have held you in bondage, all of the things that have uh, restrained you, held you back, addictions to this and struggles with this, whether it's, well, it doesn't matter what it is. Whatever the things that you find hard not to do, you know you're not supposed to do them, but you, you keep running back to it over and over again. Whether it's porn or anxiety, any of the things that you run back to, During the Day of Atonement, the Day of Atonement, Jesus Christ has forever settled the score. He's canceled all the debts. The trumpet has sounded and the exiles go free. So whatever you're in bondage to, it is a a uh, self-induced bondage. You're giving yourself to it. It can't hold you anymore if you're in Christ Jesus. If you're not in Jesus Christ, then I proclaim jubilee to you. I proclaim to you that through the Day of Atonement, through Jesus' work of putting you right with God through faith, if you'll come to Christ through faith, then you will go free from the bondage that holds you. You will absolutely do it. I think it's awesome that it's on this same day that the trumpet of jubilee is sounded. The last implication that I have for you is, and this one's kind of mine, this is, yeah. You, um, you take the place of the old tabernacle. You take the place of the old temple. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that you are a temple of what? The Holy Spirit. Who's the Holy Spirit? Well, that's the third member of the Trinity. It's God. So not only do you get to go to a place where you can experience the presence, this immediate presence of God, (laughs) you are the place of experiencing God's full presence. You are the place. You are the temple. The Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you. Jesus was the true temple. His body was stripped and torn down and then raised back up three days later. Why? So that we could be raised up with him. We've been raised up as temples. You see, this is an echo, at least, of Eden. It's an echo of Eden where we have now returned to this place through faith in Jesus Christ. We've returned to this place of being with God him confidently in his presence so my invitation to every person sitting here this morning is simple come to him the lamb who was both slain for sins and led away to remove them you see jesus is the 
the, 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 the goat who was killed for sins is the type of Jesus. The goat who was led away into the wilderness is a type of Jesus. And so there's somebody here this morning, I just feel confident of it, in a room this size, in a room with this many people of it, it, I'm confident that there's someone here, whether you're 12 years old, whether you're 25 years old, whether you're 50, there's someone here who's heard the gospel a lot of times, and yet you've just kind of kept on going with some kind of quaint religious moralism. You're still trying. You're still working at it. You're still trying to improve yourself and and, and get right before God. You're still trying to put the finishing touches on so that God will love you better. And I'm pleading with you this morning, stop. Stop. This is a day of solemn rest. Where you look to Jesus and say, Oh God, I trust that he did everything necessary. I trust that what happened in shadow in Leviticus 16 happened in true form in the Gospels and that through faith, I can confidently enter God's presence. Not only that, I can confidently be the place of his residence. Let's pray.